Welcome. Welcome online. These are people who are online with us today. Welcome to Northwest Church Online. I wonder where they are online. Wow, it would sure be great if you commented, yes. tell us where you're located, because we like to know who we're worshiping with, and also just to know what our ministry is blessing, what areas. Like, share, and subscribe. Perfect. Like, share, and subscribe. Please do that, because uh, we would love to hear from you. And please comment. We'd love for you to comment. Make a comment. We have that happen every week, don't we? We hear from all kinds of folks. Yes, we do. Yeah, from all kinds of places. If you want to request prayer, we'd love to pray with you about whatever's going on in your life. Even if you want to just tell us that it's an unspoken request, we'd be glad to pray with you. Absolutely. And we have a really safe and secure format. If God lays on your heart to share in the ministry here, we would love to, we would love to invite you to do that. Northwestchurch.church. And you can go on and uh, you can see online giving. You can have an opportunity to give to our missions offerings. Uh, you can give to, to the ministry here at Northwest so we can continue to do what we are doing, sharing the gospel, preaching the truth of Jesus' love. And So help us out with that. And, and uh, I know the Lord will bless you for that. What else you got? We have a great time of worship here. We praise God. God is with us here in this church. We just want you to worship and, and praise along with us. So wherever you are, we're getting ready to do that right now. Uh, our group is right here on the platform getting ready to lead us into worship. We're going to be preaching the word following that. And so settle right in, gather your family around. Let's sing worship songs to Jesus and let's open his word. And it'll be a, it'll be a blessing. We're looking forward. We're so happy again that you're with us today, right? Right. Worship the Lord today with Northwest Church. Yeah. Welcome. greater look at somebody and say Jesus is greater well, let's get this started right today Jesus is greater than uncertainty that's where we're going to be today now death and taxes somebody told us we can be certain of that right but there's so many things that we are uncertain of we're uncertain about our health I, I will I get sick I'm uncertain about relationships will he stay or will he go what about my job and and uh, should I buy this or should I buy that I'm I'm uncertain about so many things we face all of us face uncertainty the American Psychiatric Association put out a recent survey and they said that because of coronavirus 59% of people said they have higher levels of uncertainty than they ever have had before. 25% of them said that their uncertainty was so bad that they couldn't focus on other areas of life. And have you noticed, we live in a crazy, uncertain world in uncertain times. What will the economy do? What if I can't make my house payment? What, what if I get sick? Or what if someone I love gets sick? What if I get married and I find out I don't like her very much or she doesn't like me very much? There, there's a lot of things that are uncertain in life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, it says this. We don't find out anything that will be. In the book of James, it says this. We don't even know what tomorrow will bring. So there's uncertainty. What ifs? Psychologists call it counterfactual thinking. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves living in a land of what ifs. And so if you're like me, you pull out of your driveway, you get down the road, and you wonder, what if I didn't shut the garage door? Now, that's probably just me. None of you ever do that. I, I get it. You, you, you've probably never experienced it. Or you wonder, what if Brahms is running that sale on frozen yogurt, you know, the waffle cone? I better go check because I'm uncertain about that. One of the things I want to know about. See, it's easy to get into uncertainty, and it's really hard to get out. Because the truth is, we don't know what the future will hold. And we're not sure how it's all going to work out. So uncertainty can be a problem, right? Uncertainty. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you're ready, Jesus is greater than uncertainty. So turn in or turn on your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. Yes, 
Hebrews chapter 6. And remember, when you begin the book of Hebrews, actually chapter 6, the author is telling them to leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, go on to maturity. We want you to grow up. Stop drinking milk. You need to get into some meat. You're supposed to be teaching, but you're not. You're immature as a believer in Christ. And so that's how he begins chapter 6, and he wants them to move on to something different. And sometimes when we move on to something different, it can feel uncertain, right? Will it work out? What if it doesn't work out? And what if it's a mistake? What if the relationship ends in divorce? What if I pick a major in college and then I change my mind? What if I don't like the job? What if I retire and then I have to go back to work? What if this and what if that? And with all the uncertainty, Hebrews chapter 12 is all about certainty. It's about hope, but not just hope like you might define hope, like a wish, I wish it would happen, I, I wish this would happen, I wish that, but, but hope that is anchored, sure and certain hope, and take it to the bank kind of hope, hope that results because of faith in the promises of God, and, and, and listen to me, come wide awake, people need hope, do you agree? People need hope, you, you, you and I need hope, there's just so much hopelessness and lack of hope in our world, how many of you need hope today, right? And do you know somebody that needs hope? Somebody that is living a life of hopelessness. And I'm convinced that God is speaking to you and to me about hope. Hope for the country. Hope for your family. Hope for your job situation. Hope for an answer to the mess that we live in in this world. So today, we're going to talk about being anchored in hope. That's how we understand Jesus is greater than uncertainty. It's because we have a hope. A hope that is an anchor. And, and my prayer is that by the time you leave today, that your hope will be anchored in Jesus. Uh, let me read a, a few weeks ago, it kind of, uh, we, we started a few weeks ago in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, and I want to use it as a springboard, kind of go back and, and get some of that background, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, and, and I want us to read it together. Here's what it says, but beloved, we are confident, everybody say confident. We are confident of better things. That's what hope is. That's what hope is about. We are confident concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Verse 10 says it like this. It says that, it says, for God is not unjust, get this, to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. Now, now, let me back up and say, yes, he was addressing a group of people who were not serving in the way that they should be serving. He was, he was addressing a group of people who had become lazy, spiritually lazy. Uh, they were people who we might call pew sitters, people who aren't a part of the crew, but more a part of the crowd. And I just want to say, listen, this is some encouragement in Scripture when you get down into these verses. He's saying, listen, you were serving. You, you, were, you were actively serving. You were a part of the crew, not a part of the crowd. You're serving on our dream team. You're connecting together with other people in connect groups. And listen, God is faithful, he says. Notice what he says. He, the, he, God does not forget what you're doing. He's not forgetting your labor. He doesn't forget that you work and you pray and you practice and you prepare and you play instruments and you sing songs of worship and you lead us in these songs of worship. He doesn't forget. He's not absent when you're back there greeting people as they're coming into this building. He, he's not forgetting that you're on your knees back in one of these Sunday schools school rooms with these little four and five year old children and you're reading the Bible to them. He's not missing the fact that you get here and you turn buttons and you get us online and you help us connect with a wider audience to present the gospel. God is not forgetting what you're doing, your labor of love. Circle that word in scripture. It's a labor of love. And everything you do for God, listen, he's not forgetting those things. He's seeing those things, even when other people don't see those things, which isn't why you do it anyway, I hope. I hope you're doing this to the glory of God. You're engaged. Again, you're part of the crew. You don't just have a t-shirt, but that t-shirt has actually gotten a little sweaty from time to time as you've been moving and working and laboring in love for the kingdom of God. God does not forget. 
You get that. And what verse 11? I'm sorry. If I'm not careful, I'll preach every one of these scriptures and not get to where we want to get today. Verse 11, it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. What diligence? The, the energy and the effort, that focus and eagerness and to the full assurance of hope. In other words, you're filled up with this hope. You're overflowing with hope until the end. Verse 12, that you do not become sluggish. Here we go. That you do not become lazy, but you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Remember, we talked about those. He's addressing, he's taking us back to the Old Testament, to that group of people who were wandering in that wilderness for 40 years, not the former generation, but the one that actually was able to inherit the promised land. And during those 40 years, they're being trained by their moms and their dads and the ones who blew it in the wilderness and the ones who understood by personal experience, we need to help you train you as soldiers and moms and dads and priests and, 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 and servants of God. And so here's who he's talking about. And they made it. How did they make it? Two words. Somebody help me. Faith and patience. That's how they made it. They inherited the promises by faith Impatience, verse 13, for when God made a promise, here we go, now we're into some new territory. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. I promised the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me. No, this is God, so help me, me. This is God. God is swearing. He's got no one else to swear. There's no one above him. Notice what he says. So he swore by himself. Verse 14, it says, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. After so, after, everybody say after. He had patiently endured. Now we're talking about Abraham. After he had patiently endured, after Abraham had exercised internal, external control and influence and power over resistance and opposition and temptation, after all of that, he learned to do that. He was now strong enough, and the Bible says he obtained the promise. Verse 16, it says this, for men indeed swear by the greater uh, uh, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all disputes. I swear on my mama's life. I swear on my new Ford pickup. I, you, you hear what he's saying? We, we do that as an end of all dispute. Here's where we're going to start today. So, so let's start talking about this anchor of hope. Verse 16, here's what he's talking about. Get this. Verse 16, he's talking about people who would swear by something greater than themselves. Uh, they would give an oath of confirmation that would end all dispute. Now, a dispute is a disagreement between different opinions or contrary or contradictory thoughts. So, so you have a different opinion about something. I, I see it this way and, and you see it that way. I, I feel this way and, and you feel that way. So we have ourselves a dispute. How do you settle a dispute? Well, you only settle a dispute when you come to an agreement or you reach a settlement somewhere. What is a settlement? A settlement is where both parties that disagree on something, they choose now to agree on one thing. It doesn't mean they got everything they wanted, but they chose to come into an agreement somewhere along the line. So there was a dispute, but we chose to come into agreement. So here's, it says this in verse 16, get this again, that this oath of agreement was the end of all dispute. In other words, it's settled. We agree. Now keep this in your heart because I'm, I'm building something here, all right? So hang in there, hang in there with me. You're going to need something that we just gave you in just a moment. So, so it's the end of all disputes. Once we have a, a, an end of all disputes, there's no differing of thoughts. We come into agreement. All right, that's where we're at. Now look at in verse 17. In verse 17, it says, thus God, thus God, because men did this. They said, if I give an oath, it's going to end all disputes. So God said this, okay, then I'm going to end some disputes in your hearts. Notice this, God wants to end all disputes in our hearts. He knows there's going to be some contradictory voices and opinions going on in our heads all the time. He knows 
We hear voices, okay? He, he knows we have all kinds of feelings that are tugging and pulling at us. So, so do this. Here's what he said. So, so he says, I want to end all disputes in your heart. Do you know this morning that that's God's desire? God is not the author of confusion. L listen, God doesn't want us to be tossed around and filled with anxiety and living hopeless lives. So he says this, I want to end all disputes in your heart. And some of you came into this building this morning and you have some disputes in your heart. You're not really sure if you want to follow this Christian thing. I mean, really? I mean, you're not really sure if Jesus is going to carry you through and you've got some burdens and you're, you're hurting in some ways and, and you're going, I'm not sure God can handle my situation. And you have some disputes in your heart that are contrary to what God's desire is for you. He wants to end those disputes in your heart. He wants to, so notice what it says. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Now take a look at this. What's the heirs of promise? Who's he talking about? He's not talking about everybody, so I want you to get this. Sometimes we want the benefit of the promise without becoming heirs. In our society, we do this even in our educational system, and it's sad to me, and I don't want any letters or emails from some of you parents, so please hang in there. This is just my personal opinion, so now I'm on a soapbox, but you go into the second grade class, and everybody gets a trophy. Well, you know, We had some people that actually won, but everybody's got to get a trophy because we don't want to make anybody mad or offend anyone, so everybody gets something. We jump up and down. You, you're a winner. I know you, know you didn't do your homework, and you actually didn't put in the work, but we're we're gonna give you something anyway, just so we won't somehow damage your little psyche. And if you're Johnny and little Johnny wants to chew the leg off of the kitchen table, that's okay. He's just showing out his aggression. It's okay, you know, so we wanna give him some kind of reward. I mean, hey, look how well you chewed that leg. I'm, I'm telling you, I gotta get off this soapbox. And, and, and if I offended anybody at all, I'm sorry. I, I'm just saying to you, please, please don't email me about that. But what, we live in that kind of world. And the Bible says this. The Bible says everyone runs in a race, but not everyone wins. So run in a way that you will win. That's, that's what it says in the Word of God. There is a promise that is to those who will run this race and run it to the honor and the glory of God. Those are the ones who are heirs of the promise. The heirs of the promise are those who've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Do you see yourself in Scripture today? Because he's talking about you and he's talking about me. The Bible says that if you've come to know Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. Somebody say amen. amen. I became an heir when I came to know Christ and received him, when I give my heart to him. So God said this, he, he, he determined to show, notice this, abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability. <laughs> I just love saying that word. Can I say it again? Immutability. Immutability. I just like it. It's cool. And don't you like the way that rolls off? If you're, if you're asleep right now, wake up and say immutability. Immutability. I, and here's what it means. It means unchanging. It means he doesn't change. He doesn't waver. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. His counsel means his plans, his purpose, his intentions for your life. Now, here's a characteristic of God that we need to get. Don't miss this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody say amen. He does not change. He is consistent. He wants to show us something by the immutability of his plan, his purpose, and his intentions. God never changes his plans, his purposes, his intentions for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says it like this. Get this one. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's his plans and purpose and intentions for you. This immutability of his plans will never change for you. His plans for you and me is always to give us a future and what? A hope. Now look at someone and say, Hope is here. 
It is. You're, you remember our series. We did a Hope is Here series a few years back, and, and we talked a lot about this hope. It's here because it's always been here. It will always be here because that's God's plan. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What if I really screw up? I mean, I mean, honestly, I mean, I really, really mess up. Listen, he still, from that very place, has a plan for you, a future, and a hope. Did you get that? Even if that part of my life was not part of his plan, he still puts in place a plan to get me to future and hope because he never changes. He's not like us. He never says, you made your bed, now lay in it because you deserve it. We say that, right? But he doesn't say that. He says, how did you get there, son? <laughs> how did you get over here, son or daughter? This is not where you're supposed to. C- come on. So I-, I got you. I got this. Come on. I-, I have a plan. I-, I have some hope for you. You don't need to be over here. I understand. You blew it. Okay, let's go. Do, do you get the picture? My plans and intentions for you is always to give you a future. And a hope. So, so come on. Do you hear him? Come on. Let's go forward. Let's go this way. And then we say, well, you know, God, you don't understand. I've made such a mistake. I've really messed up. You don't understand. And he says, I know you did. I, I, I knew it before you even did it. I understand you. I know you better than you know yourself. So, so, so just come on. Let's go. Move forward. He never changes. He's not going to change for you. And he's not going to change for me immutability of his counsel. Does that give anybody any hope today? It should. Sometimes we get far enough away from sin. You know, some of these super saints, that's some of you maybe, and and you get so far away from sin, you forget how much you need Jesus to help you move forward in your life. Don't forget it. He's never changed. Jesus doesn't. Look at verse 17 again, the immutability of his counsel. He confirmed it by an oath. That word oath means a fence, a limit, a constraint, a restraint. This is amazing because God gives himself a limit, a fence, a restraint, a solemn promise regarding acts or behavior. Don't miss that. God confirmed it with an oath. I know you're wondering why God would talk about an oath or limit himself in some way or somehow restrain himself because God is limitless, right? Everybody say amen. God is limitless. God knows no bounds, you understand? God put himself in a fence with this oath. What did he do? What is that fence? I want to declare to you today it's his word. He said, I'm limited to my word. I'm I'm limiting myself to my oath. My word is true. It will never return void. He says, my oath to you is a guarantee. I will never contradict my oath. He's not limited to what he can do in the world, but he said, I will watch over my word to perform it. If it's in the word of God, it's going to happen. Every promise of God is yes and amen. Numbers 23 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So get this and don't miss it. When God gives you an oath, he gives you a promise. He says, I'm fenced in around my own promise to you. That gives me some hope. I don't know about you. That gives me some hope today. Know that God is fencing in his promise to me. God says, I'm bound to my word. I will perform my work. You can count on it. But now now notice this in verse 18. Don't miss this. He says that to by two immutable things. What are those two things? Number one, get this, that God never changes. He is the same. He is no respecter of persons. Notice this, what he did for Abraham, he will do for you. What he did for the apostle Paul, he will do for you. The immutability of God, he will never change. But number two, he confirms it with an oath. Notice this, his word is his bond. He speaks the truth and he does not lie. Now, there's some hope. <laughs> Are you getting, you got a hope me- beaker with you today? You got a hope cup? Did you come in here with, with a hope bucket? Did you come in here with, with a container to get some of this hope and take some of this hope out into this hopeless world, out into that place where you work and, and where you live and to your family and to your friends? You've got some hope to take out of this place today because we get it because Jesus is greater 
than uncertainty, and he gives us hope. There's some hope. If I settle those two things, if I settle those two things, that God's plan for me is always a future and a hope, it will cause hope to arise in me no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm facing. Do you get it? No, I'll settle that in my heart. And if I do, hope will arise because God never changes. He's no respecter of persons. Did, did you get that? But here's what happens, you see. The devil wants to tell you that he won't do it for you. At least he won't do it for you now. He might have done it for you at some point, you know, when you were a good boy or a good girl, but now you're not. And after what you've done, the devil's going to come along and he's going to say, you, you know, God won't do that for you. He's not going to fill you with hope because you've gone too far and you've drifted too far. You just messed up too bad. Listen, God never changes. And he always honors his word and he tells the truth. Look what it says. Two immutable things in which it is impossible. It says in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation. Let me see if I got that one for you. We might have strong consolation. And that, by the way, means encouragement. Strong encouragement. What do we have? We have strong encouragement. In what? Because we believe that God never changes. And he's no respecter of persons. And he never tells a lie. And then he goes on, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of this hope, this hope that is set before us. What are we supposed to lay hold of? Do you, do you understand? What are we supposed to go? We're supposed to lay hold of this hope. Now, but what is hope? Somebody might be saying, well, I don't understand. Well, hope is not answers. Hope is not details. Well, I'll tell you what hope is. Hope is anticipation and it's expectation. I'm laying hold of expectation of God without knowledge of how. You see, some of you are wondering, how can I do that? I mean, how can I lay a hold? Get, get, get this. I can only do that if I believe that he never changes. What? And that his plans are always a future and a hope for me. And because he never lies. Because I know that I can lay hold of expectations and anticipation. That's what he said that he will do. He will perform. I don't know if you've noticed, but every time you try to take hold of how, you get discouraged. Anybody done that? You're not taking hold of hope. You're taking hold of how. I mean, I'm just going to set my own agenda. That's why, that's why you lay hold of hope, not how. You lay hold that he is faithful. You lay hold of the fact that he will. There's anticipation. There's expectation. You lay hold of this hope that is set, this hope that is set before us. And if it's possible to lay hold of this hope, listen to me, that means that it's also possible to not lay hold of this hope. Do, do you get that? I mean, you know, if God says you can lay hold of this hope, then it also means that it's possible that you might not lay hold of this hope. You know, this last week when, you know, we're working and we're, we're helping out mom and dad and we're down there and it's really busy and a, a, lot, of, a lot of things going on, a lot of work. And, and uh, so I, I got up and, and I wanted to get out and beat the heat. So I'm outside, uh, you know, weed eating, doing all of these things. And, and so I wanted to try to beat that Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma heat. And so I'm out there working. And, and after a little while, I don't know if it's my brother-in-law or someone, maybe my sister, somebody came in and said, hey, guess what? Tonight, we're going to go eat at this certain restaurant, and, and it's a great restaurant, and, and I always love, and, and I'm looking forward to it, because we, we're, we're going to go at a certain, certain time, so now, let me tell you what happened, I'm sweating, and I'm working, and, and I'm out there, and it's hot, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, and, and I'm thinking, oh, but, mm, six o'clock tonight, well, I'm going to be sitting down in some air conditioning, and I'm going to have before me this this meal, and I'm going and and so and I'm and so do you see how it works? So I'm I'm getting after it, and it's it's not easy, and it's hard, and it's hot, and I'm thinking, wow, man, you know this is this is tough. But oh, hey, <laughs> I have an expectation, I have an anticipation that I'm not going to be here all day. Here in a little while. I'm going to be somewhere else. And that's the hope that you lay hold of. Not that you see it all in this moment, but you're going to. 
You want to think about Abraham? That's who we're talking about because Hebrews chapter 6, when you get to verse 13 all the way through verse 20, we're talking about Abraham, Abram, Abraham, Father Abraham, Father Abraham had many sons. And, and so we're talking about Abraham. And so here's Abraham. He's 75 years old and he gets a promise from God that you're going to bear a son. Now his wife's no spring chicken and he's certainly not. And so 25 years later, Isaac, comes on the scene. And it was accounted according to Genesis 22. You can read the story. You can read that entire story because this actual scripture in Hebrews 6, portions of that are taken from Genesis 22 where we get an inclination of this promise of God. And now we're hearing it again in Hebrews chapter 6. And it's amazing to me, he's an old dude and he's getting ready to have a son. And you could talk about, you know, the, the, the Isaac experience on the mountain, the, the sacrifice, and, and, and we can say, well, wow, that was crazy, wasn't it? And yet God had provided for a, uh, for a substitute. God never intended for Isaac to, he just, he was after Abraham's heart. You see how that works. Can you imagine? Now, we know, we say, man, Abraham, he, faith and patience and, and what a God, and he was. The Bible, it was accounted unto him righteousness according to the word of God. And you don't get that just by hanging out or having your name on a church roll. He was actively serving his God, faithful to his God. And there weren't a lot of support systems around. Man, he didn't have the internet. He couldn't Google Romans chapter 8. He didn't have all of that at his disposal. But what he did have was his faith in God, and it was powerful. But 25 years, he's weed eating. Now, I'm using my illustration. Sorry if I can mix some metaphors. Uh, he, he's out there weed eating, but he's thinking, hey, 6 o'clock <laughs> is coming. 6 o'clock is coming. See, too many of us mess up. Even Abraham did. Yeah. So, so let's get this. Abraham said, well, it's not going to happen. So God, we're going to help you out. Let's take the handmaiden and let's make this thing happen. And then, of course, we know Ishmael comes onto the scene. And, and we've had problems with that all along and still do today. Right? And Father Abraham, look at him. He's faithful. He, he, he's laying hold of the hope. And it's an anticipation. And it's an expectation that God is God. And God doesn't change. And he's the same yesterday today, and forever. And God, was, God does not lie. And if he tells you that he will never leave you nor forsake you, then it is true. Take it to the bank. Yeah, you, you, you see where we're at in Hebrews 6. Here's an anchor of hope for you today. And take it with you. You're going to need it this week. You're going to need it in your relationships. You're going to need this at your workplace. You're going to need this as you struggle with this discipleship and following Christ. You're going to need this hope because sometimes the hope meter is going to be a little low. Here's what it means. It means you take hold of it. Take hold of it. Take hold of it. Because if you can take hold of it, it also means you might not take hold of it. And that's tragic. It means you, you have the possibility to lay hold of this hope. Before the COVID-19, I, I, I booked a flight to Seattle and something weird happened. I, I don't remember. I missed the flight somehow. Not, uh, and so, so the, they put me on, uh, the next day, they put me on, uh, on another flight. When I arrived, I, I came and I checked in. And the lady told me, well, we're going to put you in first class. I said, wow, how cool is that? Don't get too excited. It was a small plane, but, 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 but I wasn't complaining at all. Because, you know, when you fly coach or you fly economy and you fly with all those other peasants, you know, back there, which I typically do, that's uh, so, so where I always fly. But when you fly that, they come by and they give you this option. They're going to give you, you know, something that kind of resembles a cookie. Not sure what it is, but, but they're going to give you that option or maybe some check mix or something like that. But when you get to first class, whoa, leg room. Leg room, a plant, and then they bring them out of that basket. That basket has bananas and chips and cookies and, and, and all that stuff in it. And, and they bring it to you and, and they say, Why don't you just pick out what you want? <laughs> and I'm like thinking, Well, which one do I choose? And she says, Well, as much as you want. Wow. I'm kind of looking back saying, you guys, look where I am. No, I'm not. I'm not looking. But, 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 but I, I, could, I could have whatever I wanted. It was laid out before me. It was for me to choose. I could take it or I could leave it. 
was my choice. You see, this hope has been set out before us. It's available, get this, it's available for you and me, but we have to lay hold of it. There's anticipation and expectation of what God can do in your life. It's set before you. God wants me to tell you something. Are you ready? If you lay hold of it, you're going to experience the most hope. This hope meter is going to blow your socks off. If you don't lay hold of it, let me just say to you, you will never experience the hope that he has for you. You see, I could have looked there around and I could have said, well, you know, really, no, thank you. <laughs> I see all of that basket of stuff. I, I, I couldn't possibly, I mean, I don't want to look greedy. Maybe I'll just take one. <laughs> but then I see a guy across the aisle and, man, he's scarfing it down. He's got about 10 things laying on his, looks like a wood chipper, you know, things flying out of his mouth. I'm, I'm not taking any. Think about that. Even though it was available to me, he laid hold of it and I didn't. See, sometimes we think we're too pious. We think we're too humble. You know, I'm just going to suffer for Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I'm just too humble to, to reach out for the blessings of God and the hope that he has in store for me. But here's what happens. We're missing what's available. It's been set before us. And God says, I'm setting this before you. Did you read what I read? God says, hope is here. You, you need to lay hold of the hope that he's given you. And I read it in verse 19. Here, here's what he says. This hope, what hope? It's the hope we're talking about. It's built on the expectation and the anticipation that God never changes, that he's no respecter of persons, and that he watches over his word to perform it. That's the hope that we're talking about. This hope we have is an anchor. Read on. This hope that we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure, underline that, and steadfast, underline that, and which enters into the presence. Notice that. Circle that. Enters into the presence behind the veil. Underline that. This hope we have as an anchor. Get it? As an anchor. I just happen to have an anchor with me. You might have noticed it. You, you don't typically want to give me sharp objects. <laughs> it, 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 it could be dangerous. But, but this is an anchor. Now, I, I, don't, I, don't know, I, I don't know much about that. It's an illustration. I, I, I'm not a, a seafaring captain. I, I, you know, anything. I've been on a few boats. I've, I've watched a few YouTubes. And so I kind of get it. I, I understand a little bit about this. But, but, but remember, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you something you need right here. Our hope is based on the fact that he never changes that he's a no respecter of persons and that he watches over his word to perform it and he tells the truth. That's where our hope is. He cannot lie. Now, let me, let me just demonstrate a little bit with this anchor. Uh, you know, again, here's how you, here's how you do it. I, this, this whole thing works. What you do is, is you lower it down. You lower it down into the water, hand over hand, right? You know, my dad uses old dumbbells in his fishing boats. So he's got these old dumbbells that are anchors. But, but he's had some of these before. Yeah, see, I told you I was dangerous around sharp objects. So, so what, what this anchor does, you want to throw it into the water, of course, right? But, but you, you want to get to a place where you want to be. And then you want to put the anchor in the water and you lower it down, hand over hand, and you get it into the water. And you want to make sure this thing has a hinge on it. You want to make sure that it attaches. That's what we call setting the anchor, right? So you want to set the anchor. And, 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 and I want you to notice something about this hope, this hope that is an anchor to your soul. That's what, that's what it says in the word of God, that it is an anchor to your soul. And so if the wind is blowing one certain way, you want to set the anchor in order that, it, that it's contrary to the wind. So, so that the wind is, is not blowing you off course or, or away from the anchor because you want to be set. But have you ever noticed that the wind changes direction? And so what do you do when the wind changes direction and you've got an anchor in the, in the water? You reset the anchor. See, because somebody I'm talking to today needs to get their life anchored, their soul anchored in the hope that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that, that he never lies, that he always performs what he says in his word, that their anchor is set in the truth, that God will perform what he has said he would do. Somebody needs to do that. 
But there's somebody else today that's listening, and, and, and you perhaps have put your anchor there, but you've drifted. You didn't pay attention to the conditions around you. And so the wind began to blow. And where you thought you were, you are no longer where you were. So you need to reset the anchor. And so sometimes you got to pull that thing up. What do you got to do? You have to pull up those promises of God, pull them up and remember them, get back into his word. And listen, I understand this so well. How many times in my life have I had to reset the anchor? Because I know the truths of God. I understand the promises of God. I've leaned on those promises of God my entire life. And maybe some of you have too. And yet there have been times when I've said, you know, Lord, I understand what you said, but you just don't know what they did. You don't know how much this hurts. And the loss of that person, God, how could you allow that to happen? And so what happens is the winds are blowing and and my anchor's not set right. (laughs) And so what happens is I'm not where I ought to be. And and so there are times when those winds begin to blow and and I need need to make sure that these pieces of my anchor are dug deep into the solid rock. Even though there are times when I said it, but but the opposition comes. We have to set our, our anchor, our hope, Because it's one thing to have hope. It's one thing to have an anchor on your boat. But just because you have an anchor on your boat, it's not a guarantee that you're going to use the anchor. We can have hope in our lives, but if we don't set it on the right things, it will never hold us. You see, sadly, there's some people that have their anchor. It's it's set into their finances. Yeah, it's my money. It's my bank account. Or it's my relationship, or, or I've got my anchor set in my job, or, or in my own ability. And sometimes, sadly, there's some people that have an anchor that is, that is set in their religion. <laughs> Whoa, set in their religiosity. You know, if I just do all the right things, I'm good to go, right? I mean, if I just live good enough, then God will say you're good enough. And then you forget the fact that he said... Every bit of your goodness is like filthy rags. That he alone, through the blood of Christ. Can I ask you, what are you setting your hope on? Where's your anchor? I mean, that's a good question. Can I tell you where I've made a lot of mistakes in my life? Is it okay if I get transparent? Where I've made a lot of mistakes in my life is this. I've set my hope on a desired end result. I'm going to let that sit out there a minute. Maybe some of you need to write it down. Because when I set my hope on this thing or that thing happening the way I want it to happen, (laughs) I get discouraged. I mean, most of the time I do. But most of the time, when, when I set my anchor on what I believe needs to happen, what I want to happen, because my desires will never hold my hope. I have to set my hope in something firmer. I have to set my hope in something solid. I have to set my hope in something that is unchanging. I have to set my hope in, in, in Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he's no respecter of persons. I have to set my hope in that he watches over his word to perform it so my hope is set in what he says and not what I want. Did, did you get that? My hope is set in what he says and not what I want. See, see is this helpful to someone? Does anyone here need, need to set their hope in Jesus today? So so you have to set your anchor. How many of you know that sometimes out there the water water gets a little rough? And what happens is is we find ourselves in places that we don't want to be, going in directions that we did not want to go. And so our boat is moving. And what can happen is, listen, we've got to reset that anchor. I wonder if you've anybody ever had some conditions that have changed in your life, even things that you've asked God for and it changed, it wasn't what you wanted, it wasn't what you thought it would be. You had to reset your anchor. Uh, you, 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 what does that mean? You get back into the word again. You begin to resettle on what God's promised you. You, you pull back up those promises that God has given you. And notice what happens about this resetting the anchor. And, and, and here it is in verse 19. I want to give it to you. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul is sure and steadfast. 
It's an anchor of the soul. By the way, that's our minds, that's our will, that, that's our emotion. So, so our hope is an anchor to our soul. It's when my thoughts begin to pull me in different directions. Does that happen to you? My, my hope is an anchor that holds me steady. It's when I don't feel like I have the will to keep going. Do, do, do you know what I'm talking about? That's when my hope is an anchor. It's this hope that is an anchor to the soul. It's an anchor to my will. When I want to quit, when I want to give up because it's too long and it's too hard and I don't like it, <laughs> then it's my anchor that, that holds me in place. It's this anchor that's in, in my hope that I have in him. In what? And the fact that he loves me and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's promised me a future and a hope. In the fact that his word, he will confirm his word. And, and his promises are always true and always fulfilled. And even like Abraham, listen, it may take a little while, right? Because when you're out there on the boat and you want to stop and you want to fish, you drop an anchor. And you don't want to move from this place. Because you've decided this is where I want to stay. And you drop an anchor. I don't want to be moved off this spot. So I drop an anchor. Because I want this anchor to hold me here. This is where I've decided to stay. We do the same thing in our relationship with God. So we make choices on where we're going to stay. And what we're going to believe. That's why we have to drop our anchor, our hope. And we have to say, I will not be moved. I will not be moved because of fear. I will not be moved because of uncertainty and anxiety. I will not be moved. How many of you notice that our feelings can cause us to pull up our anchor? We can drop our anchor. We can, we can declare that, that we believe God to death. Does that remind you of anybody? His name is Peter. You find him in the New Testament. If everyone leaves you, Jesus, I won't. I'm your man. All these other cats, they can, they can disappear, but, but Jesus, not me. No, no, no. No, Jesus, I will go with you to the death. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, the little girl says, are you one of his disciples? And he says, no. Serious? And then again, you're surely one of his. I've seen you with him. No, you haven't. Blankety, blank, blank, blank. I don't know what you're talking about. And then one more time. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're one of his. No. <laughs> and he disappears. Did you hear a rooster crow? Yeah, see, see, that can happen with all of us, can't it? Oh, Peter, you're, you're so tumultuous. Uh, oh, Peter, uh, you, you're so wishy-washy. I mean, you, you, you can't follow Christ. <laughs> we're worse than Peter. About every one of us, we're, we're Peter. I, I, I mean, we're at least as... Fearful is Peter. Sometimes we're pulling up our anchor, just like Peter. Emotions can sometimes cause us to pull up our position, and then we drift with the wind. Emotions. Now, now, notice again in verse 19, look at it. This anchor is both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. I want to hustle, but you got to get this. And if you come here this morning, come wide awake. This is, this is where you need to be. You say, well, you know, I thought we've already been preaching. No, I'm going to start right now. You're going to like this. I'm going to wrap it up with this. The anchor of hope. This, this hope that you have in God. Let me remind you what it is. I don't want you to leave here without knowing what this hope is, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's no respecter of persons, and he tells the truth, and his word will always be fulfilled and not return void. Notice this. My hope is in that. So now this anchor is sure, and it's steadfast, and I will not be moved. But notice this. Don't miss this. It enters into the presence behind the veil. Now, that might seem a little weird, right? I mean, to throw that in there, I mean, we've been talking about anchors and boats and water, and now we're throwing in this presence thing and, and veil? What's that about? And you probably remember in the Old Testament, do you? The original temple it consisted of an outer court and of an inner court and of the Holy of Holies. 
Now, now, maybe you remember the Holy of Holies was separated by a veil from top to bottom. Most scholars believe that the veil was about 30 feet high. The reason is because the room, the Holy of Holies, was supposed to be 30 by 30 by 30. So this veil covered all of that. It's a huge veil. And in the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God would come and manifest only one day a year. You remember, to one person, the high priest. Now, can you imagine what it would be like, think about this, to never have the presence of God to come and touch your heart? What a tragedy that would be. But he would only come into the Holy of Holies to atone for sin. One time, one day, one man, the high priest. But it says this hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and it enters in behind the veil. What veil? It's the veil we're talking about, into the presence behind the veil. Now, wait a minute. How does that even happen? How does it get in there? Listen, when Jesus dies on the cross and he rose from the grave, the Bible says this, that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, 30 feet tall. There weren't a bunch of guys with some scissors and and, and exacto knives up there cutting it. No, it came from the hand of God. From top to bottom, the veil was torn. And now what was... What was once closed off access where only the high priest could go one time a year, remember, in that room to atone for sin. Now, now get it. Jesus, verse 20, read this. Jesus, where the forerunner, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is greater, has entered for us. Underline that. He has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Here's what that's talking about. Jesus, when he died and he rose from the dead, there was a mercy seat in the Holy of Holies where the high priest would apply the blood for the atonement of sin. Jesus went into the Holy of Holies and he applied the blood for our sins. And so now, listen, my anchor can go in behind the veil because the veil has been torn in two. And now my hope is anchored in his presence. Do you get where we are now? How cool is that? You see where we are? We need to get this. We need to get this again. My hope is built on what? The fact that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he's no respecter of persons, get this, and that God is true, and he will not lie, and he watches over his word to perform it. (laughs) That's my hope. How about you? And it goes into the presence, and it anchors me. And so where's your anchor? Let me ask you that. That's a good question. Where's your anchor? Is it in the presence of God? See, see, there's no hope outside of his presence. And you need to get this. Our only hope is in Jesus. Our only hope is in Jesus. So where's your anchor? See, too many people have their anchor in religion. How many of you know that Jesus came to put religion in its place? He never allowed theology to get in the way of ministry to people like we often do. And he also leveraged theology, uh, or he never did that in order to mistreat people, ever. He never leveraged theology in order to avoid helping people. That doesn't mean Jesus' theology was weak or wrong. He He was God dwelling among us. His theology was perfect. But you can't put your anchor of hope in religion. Because Jesus didn't die for religion. He died for you. He became our sin. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead in order to conquer death on our behalf. He he didn't do that because that's what theology demanded. He did it because that's what love demands. Jesus didn't die for precepts and principles. He died for people. Jesus didn't die for the law. He died for the lawless. Jesus didn't die for a set of rules. Jesus died for the rule breakers. And Jesus didn't even die for sin. Listen carefully. He died for sinners. Jesus didn't die for a view. Jesus died for you. Get it, get it. There's where you put your hope. And I've come here this morning to tell you that hope is here. And that hope is in a person. And we sang it a minute ago, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. So put your anchor in the solid rock. His name is Jesus. 
On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. You, you, you know, that's where you put your hope. So you live in a world of uncertainty. <laughs> oh, get this, friend. There's a place for you to put your hope in a place, the only place, is Jesus. I know your story. I've read it cover to cover. And I know the storms that will come. The waves will swell and the sky will darken. Though you'll fight against the current, you'll be swept away. You'll feel helpless and abandoned, and you'll wonder where I am in the midst of it all. I know this isn't the way you thought our relationship would work, but my plans are not for my comfort or yours. My purposes are always and only an expression of love. The scars in my hands are proof that love will sometimes lead you directly into the storm. Though you can't understand my plans, you can trust in one thing, that I am entirely good. You can't even imagine how good I am, and my plan for you is no different. When you shout asking where I am, know that I am right behind you with my arms wrapped tightly around you, whispering, I will never let go. For you are the pinnacle of my creation and the center of my affection. There will come a day when I will quiet every storm and wipe away every tear. In that day, there will be no more pain or death. But until that day comes, I will be your anchor in this storm. Hey, we're so grateful that you joined us in worship today. Bless you for being with us here at Northwest Church Online. Yes, northwestchurch.church. If you would like to hear more content, more messages, biblically-based messages, worship experiences, you're welcome to go. And we would love to see you there. Like, share, and subscribe. Amen. Worship the Lord with us online. Anytime we're online. <laughs>